Welcome back to the One God Report podcast. Bill Schlegel here. In this episode, I'm going to continue a translation of a couple of passages. Like the Trinitarian and deity of Christ, people understand the passage. Now, as before, this is a tongue in cheek translation and interpretation. But this is the way Trinitarians understand John 8:58. In Exodus 3.14, even though it's not written this way, this is what they see. This is the way they interpret Jesus' words, and they put Jesus back into the Old Testament text of Exodus 3.14 and 15. A personal word, I don't think as a Trinitarian that I held on to this understanding for long. Maybe when I was a college student and I was taught this, I probably regurgitated it. But I think when I went to Israel, and if there's a former student listening, and you heard me say that Jesus was claiming to be God, who appeared to Moses in the burning bush when he said, I am, before Abraham comes to be, I am, or that he was claiming to be the God of Isaiah, who said, I am, and there is no other. If I said that, let me know, and I'm, I'm really sorry. But I don't think, I don't remember teaching this. And I think probably because as soon as I started to learn Hebrew, I saw that this claim made no sense and that this was just, it was a strange claim. And this is a claim that you hear over and over again in the Trinitarian deity of Christ world. They just think that this is the cat's meow. This is one of the main verses that's right up there for verses to supposedly show the deity of Christ. But if my memory serves me correctly, as soon as I started to learn a little bit of Hebrew, I said, no, this is, that's kind of a weird statement. Don't use that to make a claim to say that Jesus is claiming to be God. It just, it doesn't work. And I'll say a little bit more about that after I do the tongue-in-cheek translation. So let's get to the Trinitarian translation and understanding of Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, and John 8, 58. Exodus 3, 14. The second person of the Trinity said to Moses, I am who I am, the pre-incarnate second person of the Trinity, the eternal God the Son. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Unquote. Literally, Elohim is plural. In Genesis 1.1, Elohim meant the Trinity. In Genesis 1.26, Elohim meant only the Father. But in this case, this must be only the second person of the Trinity speaking, because the second person, God the Son, later told us that he was the one who appeared to Moses in the burning bush when he said, Before Abraham was born, I am. See John 8.58. So now we go and translate John 8.58. Jesus said to them, Before Abraham was born, I was the eternal second person of the Trinity who appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Unquote. We know that it was the second person of the Trinity that appeared to Moses in the burning bush because Jesus said so. It would have been clearer if Jesus had said something like, I am a co-eternal person of the Trinity before anything else was created and not just before Abraham was or came to be or comes to be, I am. But still, this is a clear claim to pre-existence as eternal God. There's no other way to understand Jesus' statement. True, Jesus didn't say anything about the burning bush appearance to Moses here in John 8, 58, but he said, I am, which in translated Languages like English is an obvious reference to the burning bush incident. Some English translations even capitalize I am. So we are justified in clarifying what Jesus meant in our translation. Now there might be an objection to our translation. Some people might say that Jesus was only claiming to being one person of the whole Trinity that appeared to Moses in the burning bush. But that can't be possible. The whole Trinity couldn't have appeared to Moses at the burning bush. Jesus said, I am. I 
is only one person, not three. The second person of the Trinity would never claim to be the whole Trinity. Right? Jesus never claimed to be God the Father or God the Spirit. Those two are separate persons. He only claimed to be the eternal God the Son. So when he said, I am, he was claiming to be only one person of the Godhead that appeared to Moses. Plus, God the Father and God the Spirit are never seen. See Exodus 33.20, 1 Timothy 6.16, 1 John 4.12. No man has ever seen God. No man can see God. Well, that must mean the Father. And God the Spirit's not seen either. Somehow God the Son can be seen. This also means that neither the Father nor the Spirit are the great I Am. And only the second person of the Trinity is yud heh vav who is speaking to Moses here. Never mind the confusion that our interpretation leads to. Okay, now this is the real Bill back again with comments about Exodus 3, 14 and 15 and John eight fifty eight, where Jesus said before Abraham was or came to be or comes to be, I am. First, have you ever wondered why Jesus didn't just say he was the eternal second person of the Trinity? He said, I am, before Abraham comes to be. I mean, even Adam, Noah, and Terah were before Abraham came to be. Next, the word play does not work in either Hebrew or Greek. In Hebrew, God said to Abraham, Ehie asher ehie. Literally, it means, I will be who I will be. Sure, the implication is that God's relationship to time is different than ours, but I think here it specifically is in connection to God being able to make good on his promise. His promise to Abraham that Abraham would be the father of many nations and that his seed would inherit the land. He promised that he would bring Israel out of Egypt. He will make good on his promise. But the supposed connection between what Jesus said in John 8.58 has nothing to do with the Hebrew phrase, Ehie asher Ehie, I will be who I will be. In Hebrew, Ehie does not mean I am. Also, this supposed connection does not work in the Greek. God said to Moses, Ego emi haon, I am the living one. In Greek, God's name is not Ego emi, I am. His name is haon, the living one. Ego emi, I am, is not a divine title. So the ego in me, the I am, is not enough to say that you're God. You must say I am the living one. The Septuagint, Greek translation of the Bible, in Exodus 3.14, does not say ego a me has sent me, but it says the living one, haon, has sent me to you. There are many places in people that say throughout the Bible, I am. Jesus said the exact same phrase to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, verse 26, when she talked about the Messiah. And Jesus said, I am. I am he. I am the Messiah. The blind man in the next chapter in John chapter 9, when they asked him, are you the man? His response in the Greek record is exactly the same. Ego emi. He said, I am. He wasn't claiming to be God. It's obvious that somebody is scratching for evidences to claim that somehow Jesus is claiming to be the God who appeared to Moses in the burning bush because he said, I am. Ego a me. Are you the one who ate the cookie? I am. Are you the one who came on Tuesday? I am. 
This has nothing to do with the claim to being God. If we're going to take the phrase I am in Greek and say that this is a claim to be deity, there's no end of confusion. And the discussion should end about this whole idea that Jesus was claiming to be God in John 8, 58. Because the Apostle Peter, when he was preaching in Jerusalem after God raised Jesus from the dead, Peter he was preaching on the Temple Mount as recorded in Acts chapter 3, verse 13. And here's what he says. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus. Note two things from this verse. First, the word servant or son. The word servant here can also be translated as a son, a little son. Peter says that Jesus is the son or the servant of the God of our fathers, of the God of Abraham Isaac, and Jacob. And the God of our fathers glorified his servant, Jesus. Now, who appeared to Moses in the burning bush? It says specifically in Exodus chapter 3, verse 15. Let's look at Exodus chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. God said to Moses, I will be who I will be. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, Ehie has sent me to you. I will be has sent me to you. Now we find out who that God is in the next verse. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, yod heh Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name, that's yud heh forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all your generations. So, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of Moses' fathers, is the one who appeared to Moses in the burning bush. We just read that Peter said that Jesus is the servant or the son of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the God of their fathers. It's not the son who appeared to Moses in the burning bush. It's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jesus is the servant or the son of the God who appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Secondly, note how Peter says that Jesus is his servant. That is, Peter refers to the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob, as one individual, single person. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is not a trinity. He is one person. Jesus is his servant, not their servant. So the Trinitarian deity of Christ interpretation of John 8.58 directly contradicts Peter's understanding of who appeared to Moses in the burning bush as recorded in Acts chapter 3, verse 15. The deity of Christ interpretation of John 8.58 also directly contradicts the disciple Stephen's understanding of who appeared to Moses in the burning bush. See podcast number 57, The Burning Bush, A Pre-Incarnate Appearance of Jesus? And the deity of Christ interpretation of John 8.58 also contradicts the author of the Gospel of John himself, who said he recorded the signs that Jesus did in order that we might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, not God himself. And the deity of Christ interpretation of John 8.58 contradicts Jesus' own statement in this book where he prays to the Father and says that the Father is the only true God. The deity of Christ, Trinitarian interpretation of John 8.58, is wrong. So what did Jesus mean? Well, 
set aside deity of Christ presuppositions, and other possibilities emerge. I'll give a couple of possibilities, and I think really the second one that I'll mention is what Jesus is saying here in John chapter 8. One, the whole chapter is about the precedence of Jesus, the Messiah, to Abraham. It's understood in the Jewish world that the Messiah is greater than Abraham. And one of the things Jesus could have been saying here is that before Abraham came to be, Jesus as Messiah existed already in the plan and purpose of God. Abraham came to be because God had a plan for humankind in Jesus. Jesus, the Messiah, would descend from Abraham. Another possibility, and this is the possibility I believe is most likely, that Jesus is speaking about his precedence to Abraham in resurrection. Jesus, the Messiah, is the firstborn from the dead. In this way, he is superior to Moses and to Abraham and to everyone else. He is the firstborn from the dead. And he came to be in life immortal before Abraham. Abraham is still in the grave. Jesus of Nazareth is at the right hand of God, alive, immortal. Related to this understanding is that Jesus is saying, I am, ego eimi, the light of the world, before Abraham comes to be. The question, or the problem, with Jesus' statement, before Abraham came to be, I am, is that there is no, what grammarians call predicate in the statement, I am. We need context to know what Jesus is saying when he says, I am. I am what? I am the Messiah, as in John chapter 4, or I am the man in John chapter 9. We need context. And I think if we look at the context in John chapter 8, we can see what Jesus is claiming to be when he says, Ego eimi, I am. This whole section starts in John chapter 8, verse 12 where Jesus says, Ego eimi, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus' statement about being the light of the world is what precedes and brings about all of this conversation and discussion with the Judeans in John chapter 8. And he says a number of times in other places in this section, in this chapter, I am. For instance, he says in verse 824, you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am. Ego imi, the same thing. Now, many translations put in the he here, I am he. In context, what is Jesus claiming to be? He's claiming to be the light of the world. Unless you believe that I am the light of the world, you will die in your sins. This is what this gospel is saying. Right from the very beginning, in chapter 1, Jesus is introduced as the light of the world. John the Baptist is not the light. He came to bear witness to the light. The light, which enlightens every man, was coming into the world. This is Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus is claiming in John chapter 8 to be the light of the world. So all of these I am's in John chapter 8 relate to his claim to be the light of the world. Look at another I am claim of Jesus in John eight twenty eight. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak as the Father taught me. Now let's get real. Does this sound like Jesus is claiming to be the Almighty God, the God of Israel of the book of Exodus and Isaiah? I do nothing on my own authority. The God of Israel who appeared to Moses in the burning bush does nothing on his own authority. I am. I am he. But it relates, again, to his claim to be the light of the world. Then you will know that I am the light of the world. 
another point to make about the context of John chapter 8 that just shows that the deity of Christ interpretation of Jesus' statement is wrong is that in this chapter, in verse 40, Jesus calls himself a man who heard the truth from God. John chapter 8, verse 40. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Now Jesus here says that he is a man, but according to the deity of Christ people, in John 8, 58, he's speaking as if he's God. You see, you make Jesus kind of a schizophrenic, dual-natured liar. At one point, Jesus is a man who says he does nothing on his own authority, who differentiates himself from God, and then two minutes later, he's claiming to be God, using some kind of code language, ego, a me, I am, which no man ever used, that his Judean listeners would understand and they'd be shocked by. A couple of other points about the context of Jesus' statement before Abraham comes to be, I am. As I mentioned, this section begins in chapter 8, verse 12, where Jesus says, I am, ego eimi, the light of the world. I am the light of the world is one of the I am statements in John's Gospel. The I is emphasized in these statements. This is the second one. The first one is in John chapter 6. I am the bread of life. And now Jesus gives a sermon about being the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. He gives a description on how he's the good shepherd. I am the true vine. John chapter 15, he describes how he's the true vine. As well here in John chapter 8, he starts out by saying, I am the light of the world. And he's going to continue discussing, describing how he's the light of the world. The whole chapter is a description focusing on his I am the light of the world statement. And to understand that all these I am statements in chapter 8 refer back to his claim that I am the light of the world makes sense. And it as well makes sense to see both Jesus' own sermon of this section and the literary structure of this section to have a statement where Jesus is saying that again. It's called, in literature, an inclusio. So at the end of the chapter, Jesus wraps up what he said with how he began. I am the light of the world. I say to you, before Abraham comes to be, I am the light of the world. And then one more evidence that Jesus is saying he is the light of the world in John 8.58 is the next chapter. Chapter 9 in the Gospel of John is the description of a man that cannot see, and Jesus the Messiah gives him sight, showing, proving that he is the light of the world. He is the one who brings restoration. He is the one who brings recreation, renewal. In him is life, and the life is the light to men. Hope, vision, direction, renewal. Now the second understanding I think is the best one for what Jesus meant when he said, before Abraham comes to be, I am the light of the world. If we look at the word comes to be, this word that is often translated before Abraham, was, I am, that word was, it is the Greek word genesthai. It occurs seven times in the Gospel of John. Get a Bible program, search this word in the Gospel of John, you'll see that in every single one of the occurrences, without exception, this word relates to something that will become, that comes to be at some point in the future. It comes to be. Before Abraham comes to be, I am. That is, before Abraham comes to be in the future, Jesus is the light of the world. Before God's promises to Abraham, 
that he would be the father of many nations, that his seed would inherit the land, or that Abraham himself would experience the promised resurrection from the dead. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus' statement is not about what he was in the past. It's about what he was at the time he was on the earth. I am the light of the world. And yes, it's before Abraham comes to be. You can look at each one of those seven occurrences. Let me look at one. John fourteen twenty nine. It's perhaps the closest parallel, but in all the other cases as well, this word has something to do with coming to be in a future context. John fourteen twenty nine. the exact same kind of construction occurs. Jesus says, now I have told you before it takes place. This is it, before it comes to be. Same words exactly that Jesus used in John eight fifty eight. Before Abraham comes to be. I have told you before it comes to be, so that when it does take place, you may believe. So this word is used every single time, the seven times in the Gospel of John, to denote something that is yet to come to be. So let's put aside our deity of Christ's presuppositions, consider other possibilities that don't contradict the author of the Gospel of John's purpose statement, the statement of Jesus that he is a man, the statement of Jesus that the only true God is the Father. Don't come up with our own interpretation and say we know better than the author of this book that Jesus is God. No, the author tells us why he recorded the signs that Jesus did, and it's not to show us that Jesus is God. And then often you'll hear that, oh, the Jewish people, they knew exactly what Jesus was saying. They knew he was claiming to be God, and therefore they took up stones. There's a couple things about that. One, every time I hear somebody say that they knew what the Jews were thinking, they don't. Gentiles don't have a clue what the Jews are thinking. I lived in, among Jews long enough to know that the Gentiles, they might think they know what Jews think, but they don't. Secondly, if you really think that the Jews thought Jesus was claiming to be God here, and you agree with them, you're on the wrong side of the truth. Because over and over in the Gospel of John, the Judeans don't understand Jesus' words. It's right in this chapter. They don't understand what he's talking about. So even if you think their understanding is right, you're wrong. No, Jesus is not making a claim here to be the God who appeared to Abraham in the burning bush, or another one that he's claiming to be the God in the book of Isaiah who says, I am he, there is no other. I am is not a title for God. Even though the songs may say that Jesus is the great I am, neither in Hebrew nor in Greek is I am a title for God. This claim is simply putting your own presuppositions into the text. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the Father, and Jesus is the Father's Son and Servant. Just a heads up for a couple of future podcasts. I've interviewed Dr. Andrew Perry, who studied and written extensively on the prologue of the Gospel of John. And he like myself, understands the prologue of the Gospel of John to be introducing a new creation, a new beginning in Jesus the Messiah. So keep an eye open for when the interviews with Dr. Perry will be posted. Yishma'u anavim ve yishma'u. The humble will hear and rejoice.